Yesterday we had a bit of an intro with a message that you got to listen into for the for those who are your teachers this week and your counselors. And now we're going to back up to chapter 1, uh, verses 15 to 20 in Paul's letter to these young Christians in Colossae. Chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Speaking of Christ, and he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have preeminence in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. You remember that yesterday we concluded by uh, remarking on the relationship be Christ, between Christ and the soul that is freed to sing, the soul that is freed to express, to imagine, to create. Now that has doubles the significance in that this passage that we are focusing on this morning is commonly known in scholarly uh, theological circles as the Christ Hymn. It was a hymn that was clearly passed around to the churches in order to teach doctrine and truth and theological conviction in what was still very much largely an oral culture, not one in which written word was common to most people. So singing hymns wasn't just for the aesthetic pleasure, it was for also a teaching mode. The evidence that this was in fact what we could call, I suggest you take this aboard as I do, we could call this musical theology. In the clear form of a hymn is plain enough. Paramount being the sequence of clauses and phrases that fall easily into matching rhythmic units in the Greek language, very clear units and matching uh, rhythmic patterns, such as might be afforded in the combination of poetic arts and musical arts. And secondly, the appearance of various terms particularly the term visible, the term thrones, the terms to hold together, beginning, preeminence, making peace, the blood of the cross, all of which are not found anywhere else in Pauline language. Thus suggesting that what pre-existed amongst the earliest Christians of what I call musical theology in the form of a theologically potent, Christologically potent hymn. And third, the quite obvious reason for understanding this passage as the Christ hymn is the very clear structure of two strophes or two verses just like in a hymn, marked by paralleling of key motifs. And a little later we will come back to these two strophes or two verses of this Christ hymn as the basis of what I want to say to you this morning in terms of application of this hymn to you and to me, our lives today. But before that, just two very important, honestly, just kind of preliminary things to say about this passage overall that I think are of a very critical and crucial nature and really worthy of serious observation. First, that Christians at such an early stage 
Within the first uh, 40 years, probably, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Christians at such an early stage would be willing, and not only willing, but actually able to use such lofty and cogent language in extolling Christ tells us much about the intellectual vitality of the first Christian communities. It reminds us, as John Stott used to say, that in the Christian life, the mind matters. You don't park your mind at the door when you become a follower of Jesus. Your mind is enervated, enriched, becomes all the more uh, capable. The mind matters. This grand theological hymn is itself a sharp reminder that there were front-rank thinkers among the first Christians. As this language is lofty and powerful and rich and embedded with deep theological thought. Among these first Christians were these first rank thinkers, eager to engage with their contemporaries in an attempt to grapple with and to some extent explain the world, to explain reality, to explain what really matters. And I think this is equally necessary in the arts and similarly today. Let the church raise up front rank practitioners of all the arts. I would bless Chehi because one of its potential visions is filling the ranks of our world with serious practitioners of musical theology. That's my vision. I'm going to keep pushing it with Graham and Floyd and Jan and others, but I don't have to push hard because I know it's their conviction too. It reminds me, by the way, of an astounding news piece, which was the talk of Europe just a few weeks back. It came out in the Guardian newspaper in London earlier this spring. In fact, it came out specifically on the 12th of April, just this past spring. It was the story of a long-lost painting by the Italian Renaissance painter Michelangelo da Caravaggio, recently discovered by accident, totally by accident. Here is what they found. I'm sorry, it's a bit gruesome. It's titled The Judith Beheading Holofernes. It comes from the Book of Judith, a one of the deuterocanonical books in Jewish sacred writings. And here Judith is a, a Jewish heroine. This painting was believed to be done in 1598 with many renditions and early versions, many, many, many early versions, suggesting that Caravaggio strove for perfection in it. But the final perfected version went lost for 418 years until March of 2016. It was recently found only by accident when the owners of a house near Toulouse, France, went to fix a leak in their ceiling. And they found this painting stuck in amongst the rafters of their attic. The painting measures 56 inches by 56 this way and 69 this way. It's large. It is now worth 140 million dollars. Where's my son? He's an artist. Keep it up. <laughs> we need a retirement. <laughs> He's a very good artist, really make credible drawing. You have to have him show you. It reminds me that even in this day and age, front rank 
artistry is highly valued. And so like the Colossian Christians, we need not only front-rank thinkers, but also front-rank practitioners of all the arts and in music to render a musical theology like the Christ hymn. Young women, young men here studying this summer at Chehi Summer School of Music, this grand Christ hymn, take it away with you, let it urge you to aspire to front rank musical contribution for the sake of Christ. It won't work if it's a mediocre contribution. We need front rank thinkers and practitioners. These Colossian Christians, mixed as they were, poor as they were, sang the Christ hymn. Second preliminary observation is this. You will note that this hymn is not addressed to Christ, but it is in praise of Christ. And that says something very important to me in my years of being involved with Christian mission and church and ministry, that of course worship should include addressing Christ in the mode of petition and seeking his intervening power in terms of accolades expressing our love and our devotion to him. But in my experience, this is often overbalanced and easily degenerates. But the mode of worship that is more in praise of Christ is what we see here. And perhaps is more than just a corrective balance but is actually a more accurate Christology offering descriptor. Did you, as we read that, descriptor after descriptor after descriptor, extolling and exclaiming, acknowledging who this Christ is in the universe, in the world, in our lives, in the broad purposes and plans of God. There's something to be said to keep at the forefront of our artistry, praise of Christ, not just praise to Christ. Does that difference make sense a little bit? Think about that in this week that you're here. Well then, now let's turn to the two strophes or the two verses of this hymn for more of an application and see how they both challenge, I think, and also help us uh, even today. Strophe 1, or verse 1 of this grand hymn, and this is, uh, you'll have to trust me, in the Greek original language is very clear in the grammar how this plays out in two different strophes. It's just as plain as day. It's not as easy to see in English. But strophe number one runs from verses 15 to the first half of verse 18. So let's just read that. 15 to 18a. And he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Can't you see these Colossian Christians singing this? He is the image of the invisible God. You sing that out. He's the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created, both in the heavens and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. Strophe number one. Now, there is so much in all of this, but just because of honoring our time, so you can go do your hard work, I will just pick a few things in this first strophe that I think are most important for you and for me in our lives and in our world right now. We start off with the very first line of this Christ hymn, 
He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. What does it mean that Jesus Christ is the image of something that is invisible, namely God of all creation? It is the term icon, ho estin icon, he is the image, the term Icon comes from icon, an image, which was a part of a group of terms in the New Testament uh, vernacular, which were trying to convey ways of speaking of God's own outreach and his interaction with this world of his creation and the epitome of that creation with human beings to connect with human beings. Ways, in other words, of speaking of God's imminence, his closeness and intimacy with us while safeguarding his transcendence, his total otherness to us. He is the image to convey that, Jesus. In other words, it is trying to get at the closest personification of God himself. And I want to make sure you have firmly in your hearts as young followers of Jesus that everything, young women, young men, everything that can be known about God according to the New Testament who is invisible is made visible to you and to the world in Jesus Christ. He is the image icon, the best way to show the world who God is. Which is why we praise him in a Christ hymn. Another thing I would note is highly significant in this first strophe is what we come to in verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things, all things. All is quite a large superlative. (laughs) All doesn't leave room for some or a few. It's the Greek word panta, everything, all things hold together. In Jesus. It's an astounding statement, isn't it? It has been argued that this is particularly, and some would say solely, dealing with big, huge cosmological dimensions. Platonic, stoic cosmology, in other words, that are actually hinged upon Christ who is like cosmic glue. And that is true, that's part of the all. But that flies in the face of what James Dunn, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, uh, teaches, or is retired now, but used to teach at Durham, University of Durham, in, in the south country, south of Scotland, called England. <laughs> you know, all the Scottish folk, if you're watching a sporting game, a football especially, If you're Scottish, somebody asks you who you are rooting for, you say, well, I root for Scotland and whoever is playing England. (laughs) So south of us, there's this country called England, and it has the University of Durham, where James Dunn refers to this as the poetic imagination that is clearly allowed for in the liberality of hymn poetics. I love that term, hymn poetics. I hope Jehi inspires some new hymns. And to do that, you've got to bring music and poetics together. So that it is all meant to address not only Christ, who is the cosmic glue of the universe, but also meant as well to address our personal context and our own situations. So we can draw from that emphasis in the text on that word, all, in him, all things hold together. That all includes you and your world, 
your relationships, your dreams, your emotions, your struggles with anxiety, your fears about measuring up, your successes, your failures. Some of the best learning that will come to you in the next years, young women, young men, will be through your failure. But it's all held together by Jesus Christ. When you focus yourself on Jesus, all the elements and vagaries of your life find ultimately cohesion, coherence, congruence. That does not mean it's easy. It can be really, really hard and soul-stretching and depressing and you want to just give up. But cling to this, all things hold together in Him. Including the entire cosmos, all the way down to your situation right now. Isn't that a great theology that we sing in a hymn called the Christ Hymn? And that is why we praise Him in the Christ Hymn. So we move to strophe 2 that we read in verses 18b to the end of the passage, verse 20. And He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have preeminence in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Jesus' cross is where the prayer of Jesus is answered when Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Up in heaven far away where nobody can bother us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Whether it's things in heaven or things on earth, Pauline teaching says, the cross makes all the difference. Here again, I'll just note a couple out of a whole list of very important, but a couple Christ truths. All the fullness. Pan pleroma. All the fullness in the Bible speaks of the fullness of God as deity, the fullness of human potential as in Jesus was human, and thus, it is ultimately suggesting fullness of meaning. Pleroma, fullness in the New Testament idioms, has to do with understanding that instigates meaning. Uh, it's kind of sad that so much of our education in the world today seeks understanding but has no interest in how that instigates meaning. It's just there, hanging objectively. Pleroma has to do with understanding, fullness, that instigates meaning for life. Young men and women, complete real meaning is found in none other than Jesus Christ. And so I urge you, be cautious. Be warned, we could even say, about seeking meaning for your life elsewhere. As wonderful as music making is, it can let you down. If you find meaning and identity in musical proficiency, you're going to have a very up and down life. Or other professions. In my world in academia, it's so up and down and competitive and cutthroat. 
If I find my sense of meaning through that, I'm in really bad shape because one day it's great and the next it's some article you send in for publication. They tell you that is full of, you know, nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> and your ego is, whew. But my meaning comes. The fullness of meaning comes from Jesus. I think it's safe to say on the basis of the Bible that all other promises of meaning will let you down, leave you disappointed. Further, the little word, the conjunction and, in verse 20, ties the idea of meaning, the fullness, the pleroma that dwells in Christ, and... In verse 20, ties this to the reality of meaning directly to an historical event. It ties it directly to something tangible, not theoretical, not up in space floating around, not just in the idea world of the Greeks loved, but it ties it to an, a historical event that we reverently and humbly refer to as the cross of Christ. Through him and through him to reconcile all, another all, things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, this grand Christ hymn declares without reserve at all that the cross of Jesus is both the source and the measure of meaning. It makes sense of the world, God's dealing with human sin, God's demonstration of love for his creation. God's atoning desire, God's victory over the devil, God's victory over the way sin has wreaked havoc upon the world and upon people, all coming together when Jesus died on a cross, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That reality of shalom, peace, of well-being, healthy relationships, forgiveness from a holy God, completeness, experiential joy, real fullness of meaning because of the verifiable historical trustworthiness that Jesus, the Son of God, died and arose again. Now, as we conclude, you will notice, though, that I skipped over what is probably grammatically the most important part of this hymn to Christ. We skipped it, and now we'll end with it. For there is only one place in this hymn, only one, where the objective of it all, the objective of this praise of Christ is offered. And that is in verse 18, in the one so that, telling us what is the purpose, the objective of it all, a hina clause, translated either as so that or therefore, but hina is very strong that we find at the end of verse 18. Here is what it's all for. So that... You might have this wonderful, gushy relationship with Jesus. No, so that he himself might come to have preeminence, supremacy, first place in everything. This is the goal. This is the purpose. Honestly, you and I are secondary. And we function best when we understand we are secondary. The first goal of God is Jesus Christ is first 
place in everything. Preeminent. And it naturally begs the question then, doesn't it? It suggests that we cannot read this as simply grand and theologically sound hymnody. But it is a hymn that levels a huge question to any who would dare to sing this hymn. Is Jesus Christ preeminent in your life? Is Jesus Christ first place in my life? Am I contributing to works around me and ministries and avocations and even professions that make clear to the world that it is not about us? It is about Jesus Christ whom God gives the highest of honors at His name. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Young Men, young women, I just so want that Chehi pushes before you. Let Jesus be preeminent. Do your hard work of music making for the goal of His supremacy in your life and in your world and in your relationships. Is he preeminent? And that leads me to conclude, as I promised, with a quote or a statement or a story from Wilmus Chehi. Those of us that got to know him at all, we just called him Uncle Wilmus. So uh, this one came to me and I had my little cards that day. It was a faculty meeting at the end of a full day of Chehi Summer School of Music activities. And in the faculty meeting that took place always after sing time, like we have, we were discussing the hymn, Jesus Shall Reign, Where'er the Sun Does His Excessive Journeys Run that we had just sung a few minutes before at the close of sing time. And this is what Wilmus, Uncle Wilmus Chehi said, and it struck me as so important that I wrote it down on one of my little cards. He said, I want our students to become the best musicians they can possibly be, but even more, I want Jesus to reign in the lives of our students, no matter what they do. Christ's preeminence. Jesus shall reign. Lord, thank you so much for this glorious day. And as we serve, as we make music, as we study, as we interact with each other, We want this ringing in our ears so that in everything Christ might be preeminent. It's in his, his name we pray. Amen.